His presence is wonderful. And His presence is heaven to us. And if you don't like the Holy Ghost here in this service and in your life, you're not going to like heaven. Because this is the down payment on what is to come. This is just a down payment, except it's going to be so spectacular and so glorious that we cannot describe or even imagine what a wonderful thing heaven is going to be. Hell is going to be just the opposite. I'm glad I know Jesus. I'm glad I'm on my way to heaven.
And I just want that in my life. I want a little bit of that everywhere I go. Brother Wilson, this church loves you. We honor you. There's nobody like you. And of course, who can, how much can you say about Pastor and Sister Young? World class on every, every single level. And if it was not for Brother and Sister Young in my life, there is absolutely no telling where I would be personally. I know the work of God in Rotan would be non existent if it wasn't for them and their uh, indelible mark. Uh, I know Brother Young took a risk on a young man and uh, gave me opportunities when. Other people might not have a funeral for my uncle was yesterday. And funerals bring all kinds of people. Family members you haven't seen. And riff raff. People that were not invited show up. It's an awesome time. Praise God. And man, an uncle I hadn't seen. Well, evidently since I was three or four. He said, oh, I just knew that you were going to end up in prison. I'm so surprised by what you've become. He said, wow, you've got to sign that. Three and four years old, you just know the trajectory of children. Okay. Evidently, I was trying to get tattoos and deal drugs at three and four, so thank God for Jesus. <laughs> thank God for Jesus. And Brother and Sister Young took me in and helped me get me on the streets at three and four. Guys. <laughs> Oh, thank God for family. They just keep it humble and straight. Amen. Book of Acts, chapter number one. If you're there, say amen. If you're not, say hold on. Verse number 16. And men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers of Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue a seldoma, that is to say, the field of blood. There's other scriptures we could read, but I'm going to cut it short there for just a few moments tonight uh, I want to talk to you from this subject the battlefield of the mind the battlefield of the mind Amen. would you put your Bible down behind you and would you extend your hands up to our ceiling and would you pray that God would have his way Fought in the mountains, some were fought in the valleys. And I, I would like to submit to you tonight. 
tonight on this rainy Sunday evening the, the most meaningful and the most consequential wars with the longest implications are not wars that are fought in a physical location, but they are wars that are waged in the mind. The mind is a battlefield and there is a war for your mind. When, when uh, as ministry, it is often our duty, our obligation to visit folks in the hospital and care facilities where there is sickness and disease. And it is not uncommon in these visits for a preacher to see all kinds of conditions. And it's not always easy to see the pain that is afflicting church members' bodies and the sorrow that they're affecting their families and the fear of death that is often hovering like a cloud in that room. It's, it's a challenging responsibility. It's often overwhelming to do what ministry is called to do. And however, I can often times I, I preached a funeral for a man from our church just a few months ago and, and uh, it, was a, it was a terrible thing the way he died. But thank God he died with, with Jesus in his life. And I can often breathe a little bit easier when we visit the hospital room when we know that the ultimate outcome of the patient is redeemable. When the doctor says it's a kidney, it's bad, but you can do the house. When the doctor says this is a pancreas, that's bad, but you can get a replacement. When the doctor says this, it's a heart, it's a bad thing, but, but we can do a bypass, we can do a sin, you can have a heart replacement. And it may take some time for your body to recover, but it will and it can get resolved. But when the doctor looks at a preacher or the doctor looks at a family member and lets you know that the problem is going on,
worshiping in the distance is the smell of flowers. You can feel the warmth of sound your skin, the bees are buzzing around you. You can, you can taste the smell of that Hawaiian snow cone. Now open your eyes. You're not an alley. You're still a town now. I apologize. But the brain is incredible because you can leave this room in your mind and still be here physically. You can leave this church, this city, this state, this continent, and you can travel around the world in your mind and in the intents of your heart all in your head. Ray Charles was an incredible musician. He was blind at seven. He saw his brother die, drown at five. He saw both of his parents die at six. By the time he said it, his brain was traumatized. But he found comfort in music. He was so gifted. He, was, he could compose an entire piece of music in his head before he ever even touched the piano. He learned how to read music theory in braille and then write it in braille. Compose it in his head long before he ever touched the, the ivories on the piano. What is going on in your head is often more real and more powerful than what is even going on in your life. And when we think of the fight to protect our mind, we are immediately taken to the fight to guard against sin. But there is so much more to the card than just sin going on in the world. The reverberating consequences of sin and there are the multitude of challenges that are going on in your mind. We've got phobias in the world. We've got depression in the world. One of the greatest challenges in our world in 2021 is to maintain our focus. The reason we fall short so many times is because we are living in a day with an innumerable amount of distractions. And these distractions are not accidental. They were intentionally designed and they are delivered by the adversary. Should be contemplating the goodness and the mercy of God in your 
Bible tells us that Judas is scary. He, he approaches the Sanhedrin. I'm not going to go much longer. But he approaches the Sanhedrin and he inquires to them. If by chance he would deliver the one called Jesus Christ of Nazareth into their hands, what would the pain be? And they told him 30 pieces of silver, the price of the Lord, uh, disloyalty and betrayal was a prophetic fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 15. It does not take long for Judas to realize he did not want the money. He did not want to carry through with his initial decision. And in their hypocrisy, they told Judas, we cannot receive that money back into our treasury because that is blood money. It is wrong. It is illegal. It is unethical what we have done. And so they used his money to buy the field of blood. And what we see from the life of Judas is a very sad and broken and disturbing thing. He has lost all connection. He has lost his initial connection with what it was like to be a disciple. Jesus Christ. He's been detached from his discipleship. He's lost his initial intimacy of what it felt like to pray next to him. God manifests in the flesh. To minister beside the word of God. To break bread. Well, it's like my believers just wandered so far away from his initial transformation that in this moment in Acts chapter 1 where we read about it, he is hardly recognizable. And if you want to know, ladies and gentlemen, it is, it is important that we recognize it's a process from going from a disciple of Jesus Christ to those that are departed and elected does not happen overnight. You don't go from walking in the favor of the authority of God to just sitting over the precipice of suicide in one night. But it is a gradual process. The process of backsliding begins with an event or a series of events that causes you to lose your balance. When working construction in college, I'll never forget working for Brother Tim Butts, building homes here in the Sacramento Greater Metro. And I remember one particular time framing a little house. It was often my responsibility to walk across the the top plate of the wall, the two by four wall, nailing the top plate and navigating around the house. And I remember one time walking across that top plate, just as an early 21, 22 year old, and I, I found myself getting a little too ahead of my footsteps, getting a little too quick up on that, that, that ledge. And I found myself 10, 15 feet up in the air, and I, and I realized that I might fall down to the concrete below because I had lost my balance. I was in total control up until the moment something caused me to become unsteady. I was in total control of my life until something caused me to become unsure. Something caused me to become unsingable. I had to stop what I was doing in that moment and I had to calibrate my balance. If you have ever found yourself, maybe you find yourself tonight in that 
You know, when you are reading the word of God, you are contemplating the truth of God. You are literally reading the mind of Christ. There is no better anecdote. There is no better medicine. For when you find your mind tormented by the injustices all around us, the unfairness all around us, the inequity all around us, there is no better anecdote than to just find a place in your life and pick up the word of God and you can get to read.
will dis distort your perspective on God. Can I just take this a second? Y'all okay with it? Other results of sin, the Bible says in Proverbs that a guilty man, he fleeth when no man pursueth him. Unresolved transgression will cause you to hear the preachers in front of you. hear what I'm saying up there? I, 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 I pass to a congregation of uh, too many people who fool around at church anymore. Because I got, I got a mess all over my church. And when I look up, you don't have to be a prophet to tell that sometimes we, we allow unresolved things in our hearts to distort the voice of the preacher in the pulpit. A preacher will just be preaching the word of God, and if you think he knows about what you're doing, he don't have a clue what you're doing. But a guilty man flees when no man pursues. God's word's got GPS, and it'll find you right where you are. The elders used to sing an old song, but the young men used to sing, I went to the rock to hide in my face, but the rock right now, there's no hiding place. You can't hide from the word of God. It'll find you on a Sunday night. Oh, my God. 
Ghost anoints you and can equip you to your full potential. That's why the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. He's already lost the battle when he believes it in his mind. The devil wants to convince you that you can allow your mind to wander as long as you never act upon it. Now, there's probably some truth to that. I teach my church in Honduras that it is not a sin to have a simple thought. Those are the fiery darts of the adversary. But Jesus said, if you think it upon a woman, you've already committed the transgression in your heart. The battlefield is not in your body. The battlefield happens right between your ears. God doesn't want you full of bitterness. God doesn't want you full of resentment. God doesn't want you full of worldliness and vanity. He doesn't want you full of carnality. Amen. We are not preaching standards. I don't preach standards to the, my church in Honduras because I have nothing else to preach. Because I just ran out of stuff to talk about. I don't draw lines in the sand and, and tell our church there are things you cannot wear, places you cannot go, things you cannot entertain, because I've got nothing else to preach. In fact, those are the things I like preaching the least. But what I'm trying to do is create an environment. I don't want them to walk out of their favorite Hollywood movie or TV show before Sunday night service and try to walk out of the profane and step into the holy. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You cannot walk on the straight and the narrow path of righteousness if you're double-minded in all of your ways. And so we try to create parameters in your life, not because we're being ugly, but we are protecting the purity of your mind. So when you can come into the house of God, you can lift your hands without wrath.
gave up on prescription drugs and alcohol to know my He said, God's delivered me. Hey, I'm preaching to you on a Sunday night. You still believe that God can set you free. God can put you in the You can love again. You can have peace again. You can have the pump pulling on the seat of the night. Place of the skull. And as they begin to play and sing, I wonder if there's an apostolic. 